right, guys, so this is lecture number two on World War II. We just left off talking about the early eras of aggression and the rise of totalitarian regimes within Europe. And so we had just left off where Hitler was expanding the German Empire and he had just made the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. Um, and so this gave him the green light to invade Poland. So on September 1st, 1939, Hitler does invade Poland. Um, he uses his new military tactic of blitzkrieg. So he goes in by air, he goes in by land. Um, and Poland, being a young new country, uh, did not have the sophisticated weaponry like the uh, German army. And so they were easily decimated very quickly. Britain and France did have an alliance with Poland as a system of protection. And so they are going to immediately declare war on Germany. And so this is going to begin World War II. Um, the United States is going to try to stay out. They maintain their isolationist policies and at this point are glad that they had created their neutrality acts of 35, 36, and 37. Um, the fighting over in Poland was over uh, three weeks. Um, before long, they're going to be able to, the German army is then going to begin to advance on France. And so France is going to start to arm their troops and their border as quickly as possible. Um, this is actually, you know, a time frame from September of 1939 to April of 1940. This was known as the phony war, um, because French and British troops were on the Maginot line, which was a very sophisticated system of fortification that France had built after World War One, um, because they just didn't trust Germany. They had invaded by Germany twice. Um, and so they feared that Germany would invade again. And so they were glad that they had built this fortification along the Maginot line. Um, and so this is where, you know, and they were prepared, you know, as quickly as Germany was able to sweep into Poland, they thought immediately that that war machine was going to march towards France. And so they, you know, French and British troops were waiting, but it kind of got nicknamed the Sitzkrieg because nothing was happening. Um, it became known as the phony war. And so they thought, well, maybe Stalin was, or excuse me, not Stalin, maybe Hitler was done. You know, he just wanted Poland, part of that had formerly been part of Germany. And so they weren't looking to actually expand. Um, but Hitler, thinking of the obvious that there would be heavy fortification right on the border between Germany and France, is going to look for an indirect way into that territory. So in April of 1940, Hitler actually invades Norway and Denmark. Both of them are not strong military power, so they easily fall. Um, and FDR is watching the situation and says, you know what, I don't think France and Great Britain are necessarily prepared for this all-out war. So while he knows 1940, he's not going to be able to get the American people ready for war, um, he does start his campaign for, quote, preparedness. He says, we just need to be prepared. We don't know what's going to happen in the near future. Um, so he gets past a huge appropriations bill. Um, he starts to manufacture some weaponry, um, some mechanics and things that we would need for a war effort. So it's a gradual approach to the war. Um, before we get to Operation Barbarossa here, though, we are going to see the invasion take place of France. So since he, um, since Hitler went through Denmark and Norway, he is going to go from a northern perspective. So instead of going right across the German border with France, instead he's going to come down through the forest, which was seen as impossible to be able to come through. And so it is an idea, a surprise of attack. Um, the German offensive is going to... Um, decimate the French and British. They're going to be on retreat. They have to, um, you know, move quickly to the sea. And so uh, 400,000 French and British troops are actually going to be trapped at the beaches of Dunkirk, um, which is on the French side of the English Channel. And so the Allied powers realize that they're going to be able to stay in this war if they want any attempt to try to contain Hitler in any way. They have to get all of those troops out of France and back to Great Britain very quickly. So in less than a week, a fleet of all types of uh, ships, fishing ships, tugboats, boats, uh, river barges, um, cruise liners, naval ships, everything. Um, there were more than 800 vessels who are going to go across the English
English Channel and try to rescue as many of these British and French um, and even Belgian troops as much as possible. So 330,000 troops are going to be saved. However, they suffer huge losses in supplies, supplies that they cannot afford to lose. Um, thousands of guns and tanks and major artillery guns um, are going to go into the hands of Germany, but ultimately they were able to save their people. Um, a few days later is when they will um, Germany will actually take over Paris. So in June of 1940, um, Paris will fall. And so kind of to rub a little salt in the wound, Germany made France uh, sign their surrender papers to Germany in the same railway car that Germany had to sign their surrender papers to end World War I. And so this was a major feat. This was, you know, kind of a, you know, another tally mark on the list of to do things. He had conquered Poland, now he's conquered France. So really, um, Hitler's only major enemy that is left is to take on Great Britain. Of course, he cannot conduct a land invasion of Great Britain. He's going to have to create an aerial attack. And so by August, of 1940 is when the Battle of Britain will commence. Um, Germany will launch an air war. Um, the Luftwaffe is going to begin bombing um, all over Britain, targeting major industrial areas and of course the heart of Great Britain, um, the city of London. And so um, throughout the attacks, you know, on one single day, for example, August 15th, 1940, approximately 2,000 German planes uh, flew over Britain and every night for two solid months, bombers um, attacked the city of London. And so this became known as the Battle of Britain. And for any of you who are Narnia fans um, in the story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that's why the children are sent to the professor in the countryside. Um, but this was happening during the Battle of Britain. And this was not uncommon. Many families, if they had a means to get their children out of the city and out of harm's way, they sent them to friends or family out in the countryside. Those who had to remain in the city would actually go and sleep in the underground during the Battle of Britain. And this is where Winston Churchill becomes a key figure for the British because he becomes their inspiration. He's telling, you know, we're never going to give up. We're never going to surrender. Um, and he becomes the backbone for the British people. And he was seen out surveying, like, the previous night's bomb raids, you know, he became that symbol of courage for the British people to kind of continue on with their life. Um, the Royal Air Force is going to start to combat against the German ships, or not German ships, German planes as much as possible. And so by October of 1940, Hitler is going to abandon his bombing campaign of um, during the Battle of Britain just because it's becoming very costly and it wasn't effective. He wasn't able to defeat the British. So um, it wasn't as swift of a victory for Hitler when it came to Great Britain. But ultimately, Great Britain was only holding on by a thread. And so they are going to need American support very quickly. Now, getting to this last event here on this slide, June of 1941, since Hitler was not able to take down Great Britain, and by June of 1941, Great Britain was being uh, supplied by the United States to try to hold on um, within the war, um, he started to look elsewhere. Um, at this time, Hitler decides to invade the Soviet Union. He decides to break the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union because he is in desperate need of oil. He needs access to oil fields. And one of the things why um, Hitler wanted to defeat Great Britain was to get a hold of the British territory in the Middle East so he could get to those massive oil fields. So um, in Operation Barbarossa, Hitler uses his blitzkrieg to invade the Soviet Union. Um, and even though his plans for a quick victory, the battle is going to last until 1943. Um, the Soviets aren't going to give up. Stalin digs in his heels. Um, he bought his time with the non-aggression pact, even though he is not uh, fully equipped as well as the German army. One thing that the Soviet Union has and has always had is a mass population. So Stalin is going to be able to throw his people at this war effort and keep replenishing his troops when it becomes necessary. Um, Stalin also issues the scorch the earth policy and so even though the Soviets are in retreat early on in the invasion in June of 1941, Stalin you know, gives the orders to the Soviet people even though it's going to hurt even the civilian population to burn everything. You know if the Germans are going to take land they're going to take scorched land. They're not going to get food, they're not going to get infrastructure, they're going to get nothing from the Soviet Union. So if the Soviets can't have it neither can the Germans. Um, which means even the civilian population is going to have to go without within the Soviet Union. 
And so looking at the map here of Europe in 1940, you can see uh, Germany kind of center stage there. They've taken over the northern part of France, um, the unoccupied zone um, that is going to be near Switzerland. Of course, Switzerland is going to remain neutral. Italy is, of course, on the side of Great Britain. They're looking to expand. And Germany has also expanded out into um, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia on his way to invade the Soviet Union on the most western borders there of the Soviet territory. So by August of 1941, FDR realizes that the United States is going to be brought into this war. Um, and he is actually, prior to this, started to give resources to um, Great Britain through the Lend-Lease program, which we'll take a look at here in a moment. Um, excuse me. The Lend-Lease policy um, broke the Neutrality Acts, you know, um, FDR kind of quoted and explained to Congress, he's like, you know, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you're going to lend them your garden hose. You're going to help them out. And he's saying, look, Great Britain's house is on fire. You know, they're hanging on by a thread. France has fallen. Hitler's military regime has now invaded the Soviet Union. We've got to do something. We have to act. Otherwise, this war, if Great Britain falls, this war is coming across the Atlantic and it's going to come for the United States. So he says, you know, it's better prepared and help our neighbor try to fight off this enemy. And so the Lend-Lease Act allows um, the United States to lend war materials, so old naval warships and ammunition, to Great Britain. Now, they're not getting it for free. Um, we do get some military bases in the Caribbean, and ultimately it allows them to um, pay over time for these resources. But we also ship them. We start to put our own ships at risk uh, to get them to Great Britain because, of course, Great Britain could not afford to send their ships all the way to the United States to pick items up. So we were starting to tiptoe into this war. And a further tiptoe into the war was the Atlantic Charter. Um, it was in August of 1941 where FDR and Churchill actually meet in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And they start a plan for the end of the war, which is going to involve the United States, which the United States is going to be involved in the end of the war, FDR realized, well, we're going to be part of this conflict. And so it, the Atlantic Charter really does replicate aspects of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. They're trying to learn from their mistakes from the Treaty of Versailles. They don't want to repeat where they punish Germany and essentially start World War III. Um, so the self-determination, the forgiveness, the freedom of the seas, it very much replicates Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. It is a secret agreement between FDR and Churchill. They do not make this public. But it's interesting to show that it is Churchill and FDR meeting and that Joseph Stalin isn't there. You know, by this point, um, Soviet Union has been invaded. They're part of the Allied powers. They're partnered with Great Britain. Um, but it goes to show that they were only bonded over their common enemy of Hitler. Otherwise, Churchill did not trust Stalin and did not want Soviet influence or in the peace process after this war. So this is, of course, planting the seeds for the beginnings of the Cold War. December 7th, 1941, 7.57 a.m. on a Sunday morning. It is going to be a day which will live in infamy. Most Americans had their eyes on the Atlantic. They're watching Europe. They're not paying attention to what's happening in the Pacific. Um, and so ultimately, uh, the 180 Japanese warplanes fly into Pearl Harbor. Um, this, they call it, you know, it's an air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. Many of the naval officers and um, uh, sailors that were in Pearl Harbor, they were just waking up. It was like a sleepy early Sunday morning. You know, they're just kind of getting started with their day and they're abruptly wakened with Japanese planes dropping bombs on that um, naval base. The reason why Pearl Harbor was the target was that was the largest naval base we had in the Pacific. So um, Japan was hoping to create a major dent in our ability to defend ourselves in the Pacific. Um, they were hoping to hit our aircraft carriers, which were luckily out at sea at the time, but they are going to inflict a great amount of damage. Um, by 9.30 a.m., their last plane had flew over. Um, so, you know, it was a very quick, abrupt attack. It was a surprise attack. So we were scrambling. They hit our airfields in Hawaii. So as our um, 
Air Force was trying to get up in the air to combat against these Japanese planes, they had already taken out a massive amount. They sunk four major ships. They badly damaged 14 others. And, you know, these are hard to replace. It's not something that you can just build in a couple of days. 350 planes were destroyed or badly damaged. So, you know, our ability to defend ourselves in the Pacific is going to be extremely difficult. And while they were attacking Pearl Harbor, what's often forgotten is Japan was also attacking our other military bases. I mean, Pearl Harbor suffered the most damage, but Wake Island, Midway Island, the Philippines, all of them were under attack on this December 7th plan. 2,400 people died um, and almost 1,200 were wounded. And so, you know, this was the first time a foreign country had attacked quote, American soil since the War of 1812. So for the generation in the 1940s, this was their 9-11. And I know for many of you, you don't quite understand what 9-11 meant necessarily to the American people. Um, we'll never forget where we were and what we were doing on 9-11. And this same population never forgot where they were or what they were doing when Pearl Harbor came over. And immediately people took to the skies. You know, my... Um, my great uncle was 12 years old at the time and he was looking above and he was crying because he truly was afraid even in Virginia that Japanese planes were going to fly over and bomb him and his home because we never experienced anything like that you know World War One was over there the fighting was over there we never experienced war or attacks on our own soil so we felt very insecure but also very angry so here are some images of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, here is the rescuing of the USS West Virginia. Um, so trying to rescue the troops there. So the fall of other uh, bases. This is, if you ever get to go to Hawaii, this is the memorial for the Pearl Harbor attack. And this is an aerial view because below there is the USS Arizona, which was a ship that sunk with the vast majority of the sailors on board. So immediately the next day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, FDR delivers his declaration of war speech in Congress where he gave the, gave the famous line, this will be a date that lives in infamy. And so immediately um, many men started to enroll in the army or the Navy or you know, the beginnings of our Air Force and the Marines and Congress is gonna declare war on Japan on December 8th, 1941. Three days later, understanding that they have an alliance with Japan, Italy, and Germany, then declare war on the United States. And so our isolationist policies are not going to keep us out of this war. And so, you know, looking at this quote here, it says, there is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of others, much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. And so, you know, this was going to, again, kind of solidify our position in the global arena. Um, FDR says we cannot be isolationists anymore. We, our guard was down. You know, we were watching the Atlantic and we got attacked in the Pacific. And so now we are in this war and we're in a two front war. We are going to be fighting in the Pacific as well as fighting the Atlantic in Europe. And so the next lecture, we'll start to take a look at what's going to be the plan of strategy and life on the home front.